My name is Adrian Fonseca. Welcome to Catholic Conversations. I'm here with my friend Emily Alcaraz, and uh, we will be talking about her vocation because my friend Emily here is about to enter the Dominican Order with the Ann Arbor Sisters of Michigan. And I'd like to tell you all a little bit about her story and how she ended up here. We're going to go through her faith journey uh, with her. Yeah. Hi, guys. It's a lot to talk about. Yeah. So we um, we love talking about faith journeys and walking with people and meeting them where they're at. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> just want to encounter me in my in, in, in my in your, state of life. <laughs> right. Right. We want to uh, and we're building faith community. Uh, so now we have uh, Max on the on the podcast. Now we have Emily just building ourselves a little faith community. Thank you here. for being inclusive and including a Latina woman. <laughs> Absolutely. Amen. <laughs> Um, and she actually speaks Spanish. I'm like me. First, I want to talk to, uh, I want you to introduce yourself. Who are you? Uh, who am I? That's a good question. Um, my name is Emily Alcaraz. I'm originally from Chicago, a junior at the university of St. Thomas studying theology. Um, but not for long cause this summer I'm leaving to enter the convent. Cause you're going to Rome. <laughs> that too. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Like she's traveling a lot this, this summer. Uh, one's a permanent stop though. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, praise God. When was the first time you encountered the Dominican sisters? Yeah. So funny story. They taught at my high school. I went to a Jesuit high school in Chicago called St. Ignatius. I oh, exposed myself. Anyway, <laughs> so I went to St. Ignatius College Prep and I never had the sisters in class as teachers, but they um, knew that I somehow found out that I sang and played guitar. And so they asked me to come play music for adoration. And I couldn't say no to a nun. So I was like, of course. And I kind of knew them from that. And then um, we we were having a career fair one time. And one of the career options was they had a table for religious life. And Sister Thomas Aquinas was standing there. And I I hope she doesn't remember this. I don't think she does. If she does, she's never brought it up. But I I just marched right up to Sister Thomas Aquinas. And I said, Sister, I want to be a priest. Why can't I be a priest? If the church let me be a priest, I would. And she just was like taken aback and she was like, well, (laughs) she was like, I don't think many people understand the purpose of the priesthood properly. And that's all I remember. I don't remember what else she said. I just remember being angry. (laughs) That's hilarious. Uh, Yeah. So the uh, from that moment, you and you're after she told you that you were like, oh, I'm going to become a Dominican. Right. Right there and then. Yeah, of course. No, (laughs) no, not at all. Uh, So how long was it before you decided that uh, you would enter the Dominicans? Well, that little anecdote was pretty, um, pretty, pretty accurate in depicting what I was like in high school. I was like, you know, all into the the feminist movement, empowerment, everything that um, people were telling me that the church was against. And so it took me a while, but through getting to know the sisters um, coming to the University of St. Thomas and growing in my, my faith here, um, I guess it was, it's been, that was like senior year of high school. So it's been like three or four years. That'd probably be about four years, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, and so how did you get back in contact with them after you left Chicago? <laughs> More like they wouldn't leave me alone. <laughs> So I left Chicago. I wanted to go out of state. I wanted to go on an adventure. Um, so I came to Houston, University of St. Thomas. Lo and behold, the sisters got moved here uh, the same year that I came here. And I actually had one of the sisters uh, teach my theology class. So I finally got to have them in class, even though they'd never taught me in high school. And and then I got hired um, to work for the John Paul II Foundation. And it turns out they work there, too. <laughs> so literally, I just haven't been able to escape them ever. And so you were just like, you know, if I, they won't leave me alone, maybe we'll just join them. I just gave in. <laughs> yeah. So the, um, how was your, and so from the moment you were a, um, a heathen in high school, how yes. did that, where did that shift start? Mm, good question. Um, I think it was, um, I wasn't getting really good Catholic theology at my Jesuit high school. That's a shocker. I know, but <laughs> Um, I went on, the sisters invited me to go on the March for Life, which was super life-changing because it was the first time I'd ever seen um, Catholics who were like proud to be Catholic and not super apologetic about it because in my theology classes, I always felt like the Catholic professors were like apologizing for church teaching. Isn't that what apologetics is? (laughs) Apologizing for the faith? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. No, not at all. (laughs) Um, 
and then there was that. And then they asked me to go and that's how I got kind of got to know them. And then they asked me to go on a discernment retreat, which I did to their mother house in Ann Arbor. And we road tripped it there, stopped for ice cream. It was a lot of fun. Y'all got ice cream? I love ice cream. We did. We got Culver's, so, which is good Midwestern custard. So sisters like ice cream? They love ice cream. Whoa, I didn't know that. <laughs> I thought sisters were just like super plain and didn't do anything. They eat ice cream? No, their their lives are much more exciting than ours, I promise. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so what did y'all, how was that trip? Um, that was also really life-changing because it was the first time I experienced what I would call Orthodox Catholicism or traditional Catholicism. Orthodox, like, uh, like the Orthodox church. Well, (laughs) (laughs) no, no. Uh, so the, depends on what you mean by that. So the, um, what do you mean by experience the Orthodox church? Um, well people started, we, they had like a, um, so they had an all night Eucharistic vigil and that was the first time I really had, um, oh, I hate the word encounter now. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, I like to use the words ironically, but the thing is those words, they have meanings and they're good. They're not bad meanings. They don't, they don't mean something bad. It's just, we've kind of corrupted them in the church today. Yeah. So I think it'd be cool to retain the true meanings of them and, yeah. uh, and use them authentically. I'm just jaded. Okay. I'll use the word encounter. Then I had an encounter with the Eucharist cause they had like an all night vigil. And then there was a, uh, a procession with candles, the Eucharist in every person. What do you mean by the Eucharist? The yeah, U- you know, the Eucharist within each other. No, <laughs> no, no. What do you mean by the Eucharist? <laughs> Um, literally a monstrance with Jesus in it. Oh, okay. The body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. There you go. Okay. That's what you mean. Okay. Just want to be clear. (laughs) And, um, there was a a procession and they were singing Latin hymns and I was really embarrassed because I didn't know any of them. And people were doing stuff like praying the divine office and the Angelus singing Latin hymns. And I didn't know any of them. And I was so embarrassed to be a Catholic who didn't know how to Catholic. (laughs) Didn't know how to Catholic. I'm going to, I'm going to use that. So I met someone and they just did not know how to Catholic. (laughs) (laughs) I know a lot of those people. (laughs) Yeah. And so that's what I decided. I wanted, I wanted to learn how to Catholic because it just felt like, I, like I was like a fraud. I was calling myself a Catholic, calling myself a good Catholic because I was friends with nuns and I just didn't know what I was supposed to be doing or, or what, what even was the correct way to be Catholic. And so that's really why I chose to go to a Catholic university. So why University of St. Thomas? That's like really far away from Chicago. I know. How, how did you get here? Everyone asks that. Um, one, I have family in Houston. Two, I love the city. I wasn't going to go out in the middle of nowhere. Um, Three. We have cool hats. I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> um, no, really. At the end of the day, it was I was I was not actually I was going to go to a university called Dominican in the Chicagoland area. Interesting. Not very. Not no Dominicans left there. Oh, really? Not very Catholic. Um, but that was actually where I was just going to go because they were offering the most money. But then I got a really good scholarship from UST, and all the doors just opened up for me. I wasn't pursuing UST necessarily, but it just happened so that I couldn't say no. And I was like, well, it's as good as any other school, I guess. So I kind of ended up here on Catholic, on accident, but not really. Hmm, interesting. So, and then what did you do while you, when you first got here? Because we didn't actually meet until about a year ago. And so how was your first year on on campus? <laughs> well, this is another thing. I just, when, you know, when I look back on my life, I just see how everything played out so perfectly and I didn't even realize it at the time. So I didn't know anyone in Houston. So I got uh, assigned to a random roommate and, um, I was planning on, like, I wanted to have the college experience, not the good kind. <laughs> um, and I was really excited to like finally be an adult on my own, but then Turns out I get paired up with this roommate who is inviting me to go pray the rosary every night. <laughs> she she found out I was Catholic. And so she's like, oh, let's go to mass together and all this stuff. It was a lot of fun. I was just, I mean, being in Texas is a completely different culture than Chicago. In Chicago, um, there's this big controversy my freshman year because I came out as a conservative. And Whoa, I know. Crazy. My high school friends were shocked. People started insulting me. I got hate messages on social media. And that's when I just kind of cut ties with um, past Emily and became new Texas Emily. (laughs) Yeah, hey, Texas. That's right, because everything is better in Texas. Unfortunately, I agree. (laughs) (laughs) So the um, and so while you were here, the 
what, what were your, what was your plans your first year here? I was going to, um, I was going to be an occupational therapist. I came in as a psych major. I was going to do a bio minor. <laughs> that did not go well. How quickly did that change? Uh, well, I dropped out of chemistry right away. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to stick out biology. I ended up failing. <laughs> wow. That's so, terrible. Yeah. So I, I, I decided I was going to have to um, rethink my, my life plan. And so I was like, okay, well I did a uh, newspaper in high school. I love journalism because I'm nosy and I like knowing what's going on. And so I changed my major to communications. So you did the communications up to when? That was, um, up until, so like freshman year, I was a psych major, sophomore year, I was a communications major, but then, um, I mean, I was just having so much fun in my theology classes that I kept taking more theology classes until I'd taken enough that it qualified for a minor. And then I was like, who am I kidding? Um, theology might not be a practical degree, but it's what I love and it's what I look forward to every single day. And so I'm just going to be a theology major. What the heck? Why not? Awesome. So yeah, I came in and I was like, I'm going to be a theology major. I don't care if it is. <laughs> and my mom was like, Adrian, you have to uh, get something practical. And I was like, okay, fine. So I was also a communications major, but somehow we never uh, were in any classes together except yeah. this last year. Yeah. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. Interesting. I did. So one really comforting thing was that I took, um, actually with a Dominican sister, sister Albert Marie, I took theology of the liberal arts. And so the entire purpose of the class is to understand why, um, knowledge that is not practical is the best knowledge. (laughs) Why? Well, because, um, practical knowledge is not, um, it doesn't necessarily divinize us. It doesn't necessarily raise our intellect to a superior level. It always remains in a material level. So knowledge that um, is able to take us out of our um, human capacity is what um, is most important because it's what, what's going to last. Wow. So um, sounds like she was like saying everyone should just join a religious order. <laughs> Well, so it was so funny because for the class, um, she was trying to make it practical, uh, ironically. And so she was like, okay, well, take the, you know, theology of the liberal arts, apply it to your major and your career path. And it was a tiny class. There was like three of us. I don't even know if um, everyone else was Catholic. And I, I went to her office and I was like, sister, I don't really want to want to talk about theology. Can I just do my project on religious life? And so the entire semester, whenever she'd ask me to do an assignment, I'd be like, can I do it on religious life instead? <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, that's uh, that's a lot of fun. And the so you got to dive into religious life a lot then for that uh, for that class. I did. And I, I started doing that a lot. I, I mean, it should have been a sign right there um, for Dr. Rebard's metaphysics class. Uh, I wrote about the history of religious life. Oh, I was supposed to write about the philosophy of religious life, but I just wrote about how much I loved it. Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. For, uh, for his class, I wrote a, uh, paper on the, uh, the theology of suffering for a philosophy oh, metaphysics good. course. Yeah. It was interesting. I like that. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It was very interesting. I read a lot of, uh, things by, uh, Peter Kreeft and C.S. Lewis. Very interesting. Mm. But yeah, so the form after, you decided to become a theology major. How did that shift affect you? And what, what, did, how was that affecting where you're at right now? Well, I just, I loved theology so much. And, and I realized that, um, it was more than just, it was more than a college degree for me. It was like where I found my meaning and, and my purpose. And I knew that it was something that I wasn't going to be able to leave whenever I graduated from college, like theology, the study of God, was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life was just learn more about God. And so I started to realize that it was something deeper in me than just trying to get a theology degree so I can be, I don't know, a high school theology teacher. Um, and I, I'd been discerning for a long time, but I think studying theology helped a lot with my formation. That's amazing. So the, whenever you, so when was it, when, when did you make that decision? Ooh, so I was actually going through my diaries recently because I keep a journal. I keep journals. Um, and literally two, not two, one, one and a half years ago, I was writing uh, stuff like, man, I really think I have a religious vocation, but that sucks because I don't want I don't want to be a nun, stuff like that. And then it, as you go through my diaries, it gets more of like, 
well, I don't know, maybe it wouldn't be that bad. And I, I go through, um, one of my journals has this pros and cons list. I was, I started making a pros and cons list. I was like, okay, rel- religious life, what's good about it? And I started with the pros and I, I just started writing, um, stuff like, you get to be a bride of Christ. You get to start living for heaven. Now you get to start living heaven on earth. Um, you don't have to worry about the things of the world, like just stuff like that all the way down the list. And I ended up having like 20 things on there. And whenever I got to the cons, I couldn't think of a single thing that was, that was bad about religious life. And that one's when I was like, okay, well, (laughs) wow, that's awesome. The, um, so, and that was, um, was that the moment that you decided that to pursue it more seriously? I can't pinpoint a moment. I know that, um, at a certain point I realized that I did have a religious vocation. You know, I think it, it must've been when I did, cause I was a totus tuus missionary this summer. And I think working with seminarians from, uh, Mundelein seminary and just seeing how much joy they had about their vocation and how it, it, it was inspiring to me. Um, and so I think that's just over the summer getting to know a lot of seminarians, um, was when I was like, okay, this is something that I can do. And then it became a matter of, uh, when and not if. Yeah. So for me, I know I flip flop all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm like, oh yeah, I totally, I have this vigor and I'm like, oh yeah, I want to join religious life. And then other times I flip the other way and I'm like, oh, well maybe I, maybe I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so where, where did that, uh, where were your qualms, um, calm down and you were like, um, are, are like, knew this was the right decision. You were like, I need to go get the application. I need to do this right now. Um, how did, how would that, how did that process go for you? I totally recognize that feeling. That was me too. I used to, uh, I I was never able to find a spiritual director. Yeah. I mean, either it's a hard, yeah, they're hard to find, but whenever I would talk to priests or sisters or people in my life, um, I'd be like, well, what do you do if you want both vocations equally? What do you do if you just love both of them? And then which, which means you're on the right path in discerning, I think, because I've heard people ask that question and I'm like, oh, that means you're getting there. That means you're really thinking about it. Um, but then, um, it was really in surrendering my life and just becoming more, I mean, the sacraments, receiving the sacraments as often as possible, just trying to be a better Catholic. God gives you the graces to realize what his will is. And the more, um, the more your faith grows and the more he gives you the grace to grow in your faith, the more he also gives you the grace to know what his will is for you. So it's just like sort of maturing in your spiritual life, um, in that area of discernment. And so, yeah. And so, uh, I want to go back to something you had mentioned earlier. You said you kept a journal. Would you recommend people keeping a journal? How did, how did that affect you? I know for me, I've tried to keep a journal multiple times and every single time I get to like page three and that's like day two, maybe day three. And I, then I forget about it and I won't know and come back to it like a year later and I'm like, Oh yeah, I was going to do this. Uh, so how does that go for you? I actually think journaling is a very feminine thing. I mean, not that that makes you like effeminate, but I just think because as women, I feel like we just have so many thoughts running through our heads all at the same time. Um, so many like emotions and thoughts and just all kinds of stuff. If I don't write it down, if I don't get it out of my head, it's going to freak me out. And so, um, I, I, I started journaling just for like therapeutic reasons, just so, Um, when I didn't have someone to talk to, you know, I had, would have somewhere to put my thoughts down, but then, um, I started journaling in prayer and I would take my, my journal to the chapel. And so I would like go to adoration and sit before our Lord. And I would just write whatever came to mind and I would pray, I would pray through my writing. So I would just write down the words that I was speaking in my heart. And then I would just listen for an answer and I would write down whatever, whatever I heard back. And so it did help me in my prayer. So then you went to go visit the sisters recently. How did that trip go? Oh man, it was, well, it was a kind of a wild ride. Um, I took a bus there and let me tell you this story. So I, I had to take a Greyhound cause my parents weren't going to, weren't going to drive. Well, they picked me up, but it's a couple hours away. And so I took, um, a Greyhound and in the morning, uh, I was there, I got to the station late. It was super early, like five in the morning. And I was trying to find my Greyhound bus. And I was clearly freaking out. I was like crying because I didn't want to miss my bus. And so I was running all over the place. And then this nice 
Amish man walked up to me and he was like, ma'am, I think that's your bus right there. (laughs) And I just looked at him with like all the gratitude in the world (laughs) with tears in my eyes. And I was like, thank you. (laughs) That's hilarious. It was so interesting because I I was like, I wish I could have talked to him, you know? I wish I could have told him everything that was going on. He was with some (laughs) women who were like wearing bonnets and I just, I felt like they would understand if I was like, Hey, so funny. I want to be a nun. I'm going to a convent. <laughs> I'm going to wear funny outfits like you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, whenever I went to go visit the, uh, the brothers in the, uh, Eastern province, I got, uh, our, my train on the way back to the, from the airport to the airport, the train was shut down and we had to go all the way around. And I was like, I don't know how to work trains because in <laughs> Houston and Texas, we don't have trains. Yeah. And so I was like, I was just, I, they were told me take this train, get off here. And I was like, okay, I know what I'm doing. And then whenever the train closed, they're like, oh yeah, you're going to go all the way around. I was like, I don't know how to do that. And I was like almost late for the air, uh, for my plane ride. And I was like, oh, this is terrifying. Yeah, so, yeah, it's hard. The first time I, cause I'm from Chicago, we have fantastic public transportation. But the first time I took the train home from high school, um, I was also freaking out. But yeah, anyway, side, side note. Yeah. So you get to the convent. What yeah. next? I got to the convent and of course it was, um, it was, a, it was like an amazing feeling. I know people, um, say this all the time, but it really did feel like I was coming home. Like I just walked inside the school building and I was like, yeah, I could stay here forever and I'd be perfectly happy. And it's not like a spectacular school room, you know, like they they have a one floor, just little humble little schoolhouse in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, but it just felt like the most beautiful place in the world to me. And so while you were on that retreat, how did that compare to the first time you went on a retreat with the sisters? I was in a completely different place. Um, freshman year, I wasn't doing so well in my spiritual life. I had a lot of despair. And whenever I went to the convent, I was so shocked that I thought it was going to be very boring. But all these sisters, I mean, you're going to hear this from anyone who goes to a convent. They were just overflowing with so much joy. It was like joy I had never seen before in anyone. I didn't even think joy like that could even exist. And so in adoration, the all night vigil they had, um, before the blessed sacrament for the first time in my life, I was like, well, Jesus, I was praying. I didn't pray very often, but I said, I don't know what these sisters have. That's making them so full of joy, but I don't have that joy. And that's something that I want more than anything. So if I can be as happy as these sisters are, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Whoa, (laughs) scary. I know. And then, so I guess three years later, I was back in that same chapel in the same spot before the same monstrance with the same God. And so here, I actually have my diary right here. Um, I always put the time that I'm writing. So this is Sunday, April 7th, 2019 at 2 Oh three AM. God knew I was planning on sleeping through my 2 AM holy hour. So he had one of the other girls wake me up (laughs) because we had to do a holy hour in the middle of the night. Anyway, I'm home. I've been left out in the field I've crawled through the valley of the shadow of death. I've tended the swine. I have run from Nineveh straight into your ready embrace. You found me on a lush green mountainside in Thailand. You found me in an ugly, minimalistic chapel in Houston. Each second, each moment of my life has led me here. This is my Kairos. This is my fiat. I have reached the point of no return. I can no longer stand being apart from you. Bathe me in your living waters. Here I once offered my life to you, and here I have come home to be crucified, to wed sacrifice. Quo vadis, I have followed you here. I beg you to consume every crumb of me, toss me around, throw me like a child's toy, and I will adore you. Give me the grace to be used by you. And Blessed Mother, my star of the sea, it's you who has opened my eyes. It is you who has taught me to respond, to be filled, to make haste. Lord, how can I thank you for the gift of yourself? My small, humble gift is that of my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will. Sushi pay. (laughs) That was was really beautiful. Like, wow. That that sounds like it was an excerpt from a um, diary of... St. Teresa of Sioux or something. Wow. Someday. Hey, I'm planning on you to publish this if I ever get <laughs> canonized. <laughs> no, the, 
Oh, that was great. Just um, kidding. <laughs> the, you mentioned something you said, um, that he found you in Thailand. What's that about? <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> so I give this story all the time whenever I do my testimony on retreats and stuff. So if you're listening to this podcast, you've probably already heard the story. But anyway, I did a, a sort of cultural immersion uh, volunteer service trip. It was I was trying to be like a secular humanist because this was at a point in my life when I was trying to distance myself from God and my faith in high school. Um, and so I went on this secular service trip to Thailand Um, did a lot of bad things. And then on the last day there, we went for a hike, went up to the top of this mountain and we were there for, I don't know how long, almost less than a month. But the entire time I hadn't prayed, hadn't thought about God. The country is like 99% Buddhist. So I hadn't even seen a crucifix or let alone a church the entire time I was there. And so the end of my trip to Thailand, we go hike, hiking up this mountain and I got to this top, the top of the mountain, um, and I remember thinking it was so beautiful, but I was still sad because I was just sad all the time when at that point in my life. And I was like, there's so much beauty here, but I'm still sad about it. And so we get to the top of this mountain and um, I turn around and I see a statue. And I realize that this is a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary holding the baby Jesus. And I'm like, whoa wait a second, what's that doing up here? We're, there are no houses, there are no people living up here. There's just a random statue up in this mountain in the middle of nowhere in Thailand. And then we keep walking a little bit and there's a church and it's a boarded up church. It's just this tiny, like, it looks like a one room schoolhouse, you know, with a cross on the top. And I realized that it's a Catholic church, obviously, because there's a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary down there. And I'm like, no way, (laughs) no way. Here I am trying to run away from God, literally going as far to to the ends of the earth as I can to get away from God. Sounds like Jonah. Exactly. (laughs) And he found me there too. And he's, he's always going to find me. And that used to kind of freak me out, but now it's the best thing ever. Yeah. Sounds very comforting. The, the other thing that, uh, seemed like a common theme in your diary, especially for that night was your surrender of your will. That sounds like a scary thing. And people often tell me, I was, my students will talk about how they're afraid. Well, they won't use these words, but I can tell what they're, what they mean. They're afraid to be holy. They're afraid to be, to surrender their will because I think it'll make them lose their individuality. Yeah. Think about it. That's, that's the, I mean, it goes back to Genesis in the garden. Um, what did they have? They had, God provided Adam and Eve with everything they could ever possibly want. And all he asked in return was that they not eat from that one fruit from the forbidden tree. And that statement, it wasn't even the fruit itself that mattered. It was the fact that he was putting a limit on their autonomy. And that same theme I mean, you hear it today. Autonomy is what matters the most to people, themselves, their own freedom to do whatever they desire. And that's what, that's how God restricted Adam and Eve. And that's how they rebelled in their disobedience was for the sake of their own autonomy. And so you don't realize, it it doesn't make sense to people that by being a slave to God, only then when you surrender everything, will you be truly free. And that's just something that's really hard for people to understand, I think. Yeah, I heard this analogy. I don't know who said it. For some reason, I want to say it's G.K. Chesterton, but I really have no idea who said it. It's a good guess, probably. Yeah. So the if you're if someone, a bunch of kids are on an island and they're wanting to play on the island um, and there's a cliff, they're not free to play freely and run around and be silly and do whatever they want because they have the fear of falling off the edge of the cliff. It's, but if they build a wall, if the adults come in and they build a wall uh, on the edge of a cliff, now they're free to play because they no longer have to uh, stay far away from the edge out of fear of falling off uh, because they have that limit. And is that same limit, that same uh, wall that's being set up that frees us to be more truly who we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think I've heard a similar quote. I think it was C.S. Lewis. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. 
But yeah, so the uh, other thing was that, yeah, bringing back to Adam and Eve is very interesting to, to, to think about because Adam and Eve, just like Our Lady, were free from original sin. They were free from concupiscence. They had no, not even the, um, the desire to sin, yet they did anyways. And so that idea made me think of the angels and how even the angels fell. Um, the angels fell, yet they didn't even have sensory organs. They didn't uh, have temptation of lust, of uh, any of the seven deadly sins, except one, uh, that of pride. Mm. And that is what uh, the is the first sin, the sin that we all struggle with, uh, some to a greater or lesser degree. I would say me to the greatest degree. Uh, <laughs> but the sin of pride is something we have to overcome and the idea to surrender ourselves to our Lord and to our lady um, is really a way to combat that sin of pride. That is the detriment to us all. Yeah. If you do it your own way, if you're so prideful that you think that your way is the best and and that's, what's going to make you the happiest. I mean, your world is so small. It's complete. It's minuscule. But if you only, limit yourself, quote unquote, limit yourself to God. Guess what? God is infinite. So if you surrender to God, then you become infinite. But if you block yourself off from that and you just like, it it doesn't, you know, it's kind of like ironic. A surrender is what's going to give you everything. Yeah. It's the divine uh, paradox. Uh, Everything about our Lord, everything seems contradictory, but it's not. Um, Our Lord, the God of the universe becomes man and dies on a cross. Mm-hmm. Like that's makes no sense, but it's what is most freeing and what is most true. Um, the same thing here is only in giving that you receive is only in dying that we were raised to eternal life. Um, you tweeted something the other day uh, before you de- deactivated uh, your Twitter account. my Twitter, I deactivated. <laughs> <laughs> and you, I think you had said, I think you tweeted this. You were like, um, that goodbye, old Emily, or something like that. Um, what was it? What did you say? I don't remember. Yeah, I feel <laughs> like I feel like you had said something like uh, that you were going to die or something like that. You were like dying uh, to self or something along those lines. Maybe. I don't know. It sounds like something I would say. Very dramatic. Very dramatic. Um, but yeah, so you do die to self whenever you enter. And so how is that? What is that like thinking about right now? It's, I mean, okay. So reading the, de- again to St. Faustina, cause you know, she's just, she's got all the answers. Um, I was thinking about how we don't really exist. Like without God, we wouldn't even exist, you know? So even our existence is completely reliant on God. And so by dying to yourself, what you're really doing is returning to the source of your being. And that's truth. That's veritas. Um, And so dying to yourself means imitating Christ who laid down his life on the cross. And I mean, Christ came to... um, preach the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, and to also call to repentance and in doing so, you know, to save us. Um, so dying to yourself, that's something I I'm excited for. It's intimidating because I mean, I'm just me, but yeah, unless a grain of wheat shall fall upon the earth and die, it will remain, but a single wheat with no life. Yeah. In the, the Magnificat had such a good reflection one time. Um, it I, all I remember is the quote. It said, never be afraid of being a broken thing because it was God's broken body that feeds us and saved us. It was a really good reflection that one time. Wow. That's beautiful. The, yeah, the idea that, I don't know, it's so crazy to think the divine paradox of dying um, is how we are raised to life. Like um, the analogy that our Lord uses of a grain of wheat falling on the ground and dying the that a grain it does nothing if you have a piece of grain you put on your table you leave it there nothing happens but it's only that whenever it's put into the ground and then the grain dies because a a new life is sprung from it so the grain is dead but new life is brought forth from it and it sprouts into a grain of wheat i love being catholic so much because all these paradoxes are to, to some people they make no sense but in that 
paradox in the it not making sense it's like perfectly true you know so like is it body blood solar d- divinity all of the above is it is jesus god or is he man is this you know are are we um what else <laughs> what are the paradoxes <laughs> is it three persons or one god <laughs> yeah the yeah, it's crazy to think about the, the answer is always yes. Everything it's not. It was always uh, the question people always bring up is like, is it either or? But it's like, ¿por qué no los dos? <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. Yeah, it's so but funny. That doesn't always apply, though. You could be careful with the heresies. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But yeah, so it, it is very interesting to see. And um, I, Bishop Barron talks about it. He says that the like, Catholicism is different because. It doesn't say uh, yes, no. It, say, it says uh, yes to both, uh, and they scream at the top of their lungs. He's referring to uh, things like, is Jesus God or man? He's like, well, no, he's God. He's 100% God. Yes, of course, he's God. Uh, but at the same time, yes, he is man. He's 100% man, yes. And he's like, no. So he's saying that you don't uh, have to make a distinction between these two things. They're, he's both. Um, and the Catholic Church, we take those two things and we scream them at the top of our lungs saying, yes, they're both true. They're both authentic. And it's both the reality of it. Um, yeah. And so it's a beautiful thing. And talking about the divinity of Christ and the humanity of Christ, um, it's a beautiful thing to talk, think about and talk about. Yeah. Sometimes we forget how dumb we are. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> uh, how like how dense everything is in the world uh, that we know so little. It's so hard for us to understand, but for God, it's just like he makes it happen. <laughs> yeah. The thing about uh, this makes me think I love this conversation. It's great. So I was thinking about the fact that uh, Paul writes that we have a God that um, can sympathize with us. Who's not far off in the clouds that have no idea what we've gone through, that our God became man and he suffered every kind of tribulation. He suffered more than any other. Thomas Aquinas has a great treatise on, uh, the suffering of Christ, whether the suffering of Christ is the greatest suffering, uh, in the world. The answer is yes. And so the, it's just an amazing thing to think about to think our God, the God of the universe knows what we feel. He knows what it's like. Um, he's not some distant God that is just over us and dictating over us. He's a God who came to us and loves us and met us where we were at. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Accompanied us on our faith journey. <laughs> yes. He built a faith community with us okay, called stop, the Catholic stop. church. That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're making a really good theological point. Cause what is not assumed is not healed. Right. Right. And he didn't have to do that for us. He didn't have to give his son, but he did for us, which is crazy. I don't understand. Like, especially you ever, you know, that analogy that Fulton Sheen used with the, um, we are to God, what dogs are to us. No, I haven't heard it. You've tell never me. heard no, that? No, tell me. So he, it was just, um, an analogy that he used where he was trying to explain the incarnation. And he was like, imagine you had to go save the dogs. <laughs> and so you had to send your son to become a dog and then this this son who was a dog, but also your son, had the mind of a person inside of the body of a dog. And so he had to fit in and interact with dogs the way that dogs do. And I think I'm, this is not verbatim. I'm just like I'm paraphrasing Fulton Sheen's quote. Um, but imagine dying for a dog. It seems absurd to us. Yeah, that's but crazy. That's not even, that's not even half of what, the reality of God becoming man is, is like, you yeah, know, that's insane. Yeah. When you say it like that, like, whoa, the infinite God became man. It's one thing to say that and to think about, I, yeah, like, oh my gosh, would you let your son, would you send your son to become a dog and die for all dog kind? That's crazy. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> they're, they're so finite compared to the, uh, to care to humans. And then humans are infinitely finite compared yeah. to God. That's crazy. And even dogs, dogs can be pretty smart. Imagine sending your son to become like, I don't know, an insect. Yeah. A germ. To oh save my gosh. germs. <laughs> save germ kind. Even that doesn't even capture it. That's crazy. Oh my goodness. That's nuts. Yeah. The scandal of the incarnation, the fact that God would become man. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's the, what a lot of people had problems with. They're like, um, the Jews have a problem with that. The Muslims have a problem with that. Same thinking, how could 
the infinite God become man. That's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. That's what they would say. They called it blasphemy. Yeah. Um, So yeah, we have a beautiful faith. So why these Dominican sisters are not like the million other groups? Uh, Honestly, I feel like that's a question that I'm asking and I am having answered every day a little, a little more. Um, The obvious answer is that the Lord put their presence in my life when I was in high school. Um, He put them there so that they could help me um, sort of have a reversion, which I did in high school. Like they, they totally saved me. They're the reason I decided to go to, you know, a Catholic university. They're the reason I, I was so open to um, the grace. And I talked to sister Thomas Aquinas about this recently. And she was like, you know, we asked you to come play guitar, but I think all that time you spent in front of the Blessed Sacrament really changed your heart. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Um, but yeah, these Dominicans, first of all, because God made it very clear to me that they, um, I have a connection to them. He put them in my life over and over again. Um, and then also, I get along so well with all of them. Um, and like I said, the more I learn about the Dominicans, the more I learn about their specific, you know, apostolates and charisms, it just all fits me so well. And then uh, these Dominican sisters are have a special vocation to uh, or a special devotion to Our Lady and Our Lord. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So really the Eucharist. I remember having a conversation with Sister Elizabeth John when I was in high school, and we were asking her about her vocation story, and she said, well, you know, when I was going through a really rough time in my life, the only place that I could find peace and quiet was in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, and so the Eucharist was the the most important thing for me, and that really stuck with me, especially as I started to learn more about the theology of the Eucharist, and, and I started to realize that, whoa, this is really God. And, um, and so the Eucharist has been, I mean, my first love, the most important thing in my life. Um, I, I could, I would spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week in front of the blessed sacrament if I could. Um, there are orders that do that, but (laughs) (laughs) But maybe not those right now. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's the thing because I actually, I visited a cloistered convent in Chicago, well, near Chicago, uh, Carmelites of St. Joseph. And I loved it there. I really loved them. And I was like, wow, I think it would be so dope to be a cloistered Carmelite. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, I would love that, but I think God is calling me elsewhere. Which, because, just because I think that I have gifts and talents that I can share in this, this specific community. Um, they love music. I love music. They teach. I love teaching kids. Um, I, I learned that while I was doing Totus Tuus this summer. So for those who don't know, what is the charism of the Dominican order? Um, well, the Dominican order, um, their spirituality is, they, so they have several um, sort of mottos that they, they talked about on the retreat. For example, one is veritas, truth, truth above all things. Another one is, I don't know the exact Latin phrase, but it's, um, to contemplate and to share with others the fruits of one's contemplation. And that one I really love. Who coined that? I don't know. Do you know? Thomas Aquinas. Oh, okay. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, <laughs> that was going to be my first yeah. guess. <laughs> Thomas Aquinas was attributed with, a, uh, with coining the term. And if he didn't, they, he's definitely the one who promulgated it um, and made it like the, was the model of contemplating and sharing the contemplations. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. So they give, tend to give the credit to Thomas Aquinas as the one who coined the term. Uh, but yeah, I assumed so. And the third one. (laughs) And, um, to praise, to bless, to preach. Right. Awesome. (laughs) And the, uh, and there's a, when I was like a quiz, (laughs) yeah, yeah. so so the, uh, (laughs) I went to go visit the sisters, um, of the Immaculate, uh, province, and they, for their gala, and they had, the, they were singing the song, uh, uh, Dicere, uh, Pray Dicere, uh, Laudare, something like that. I forget how the, what order they say it in, but it's, uh, to praise, to, uh, bless, to preach. Mm-hmm. And they were singing it over and over again. And it was really beautiful. And I was thinking, yeah, that's a beautiful mm-hmm. mission. Yeah. yeah. And I was, I mean, the more I learn about it, like truth, veritas. I have always been a person who cares more about truth than about feelings, you know, 
like facts don't care about your feelings. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something that I think the world is missing right now is like for some reason the world doesn't care about what's true anymore. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting you say that because when I went to the Holy Land last year, the place that I most identified with, um, and it was really interesting. So um, when we were there, the sister who took us, she told us that we were going to, at the, we had a meeting at the end of every single night and we would talk about our uh, pilgrimages. And she said, I want y'all to choose a place and that's going to be your spiritual place in the Holy land. And so whenever you uh, reflect back on it, remember this place as this is your spiritual home. Um, and so every person was choosing different place and I could not find a place that I was like, I loved everywhere. Everywhere was amazing, but there's no place that were really attached to my heart. And you saying that right now just made me remind me of this. That's why I'm talking about it. So the last day or the last, the second to last day we went to this place and it was a new place that they just discovered. They were doing excavations or always doing excavations in the Holy Land because they're always finding new stuff mm-hmm. and or old stuff. And so they were there and they found a place where they think is most likely the place where Jesus was brought before Pontius Pilate. And immediately uh, we so we were reading the scriptures at the place and um, and we're reading Pontius Pilate say, what is truth? And at that moment, I, I was like, this is this is where this is the place that I identify with. And so that, that next evening she was like, okay, Adrian, cause I was the only one that had chosen a place yet. You have to choose a place now. Like you choose one, just, just pick one. Uh, cause everyone else had already chosen. And I was like, you know, I think it was where a Pontius Pilate where he says, what is truth? Because I think that's, that's what I've always uh, had in my heart my whole life. So I think we, we are the same in yeah, that manner. That that's the, the sign of a Dominican. <laughs> <laughs> And then to con- to contemplate and to share with others the fruits of one's contemplation. So the, one of the sisters when I was on retreat, she made a great point about this because she was like, well, you know, Thomas Aquinas says that contemplation is the greatest thing we can do. You know, contemplation of God is like participation in the Trinity, like Sister Chow told us. And, um, and she was like, well, I was really torn about joining an order that, you know, is purely contemplative because contemplation is the greatest thing we can do as people. But then um, I realized that this motto to contemplate and to share with others the fruits of one's contemplation was perfect because what that means is that you've contemplated as much as you possibly can and you've filled yourself so much with God that it's just overflowing and you have so much, uh, you're reaping so much good and, and uh, fruits from that contemplation that you have to share it with others. And so that's how she said she justified joining a non-contemplative order. That's hilarious. Yeah. The, oh, there's one story about St. Dominic that I love and I, I always tell the story. And so I may have told the story on the podcast before, uh, but I love it. So I'm going to say it again. So the St. Dominic was known uh, to do a lot of penance for the poor sinners. And so one day, uh, so he would constantly be up all night. He wouldn't sleep and would be stay up in front of the blessed sacrament and praying on his knees. And he'd be muttering to himself. And one night, one of his brothers is walking past the chapel late at night and hears him. And they look into the chapel and they see him and they go over in there. He listens to what he's trying to say. And he listens and he hears uh, St. Dominic's muttering uh, and, and moaning and groaning and sorrow, weeping, saying, what will become of poor sinners? What will become of poor sinners? What will become of poor sinners over and over and over again? And that was, and I think that's where a lot of the mission of the Dominicans come. You have your contemplations, but you want to share it because you want people to come closer to God. You want to bring people to heaven. And I always said that that was always my goal is to get to heaven and bring as many people with me. Yeah, I love that. And it's like, I, everyone wants to be a mystic, right? Everyone wants to levitate. Um, I'm reading the diary of St. Faustina right now, and I'm just so in awe of the incredible, you know, capacity that she had for God. Um, and, but not everyone is called to be a mystic and that's the thing. Um, I think that I want to do what I can while I'm still here on earth to bring other people to Christ. Yeah, that's awesome. And so where are you now? You're about, you're, um, finishing up the year, uh, your semester and then where, what's next? So I'm leaving for Italy in Three days? <laughs> We're going on a, a pilgrimage to Italy. Who's and, we? I'm not going. Oh, you're not. My roommate Marissa and I, shout out. Um, and when it, I get back, they have this thing called pre-postulancy um, in the middle of the summer. And so I'll be going to pre-postulancy 
just to test it out. Um, and if we like it, it and if they invite us, so it has to be mutual, then we will officially enter as postulants on August 22nd, the Feast of the Queenship of Mary. Awesome. And so what is the formation like for the Sisters um, of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist? I don't know all the details, but I know that there's a year of postulancy and then there's two years of novitiate. The first year is uh, the contemplative novitiate and then there's an apostolic novitiate year. Um, and then it, it varies from sister to sister, you know, just depending on what your background is, uh, how much education you have. But there's about three more years of temporary vows. So six years total before I would be taking perpetual vows. Wow. Awesome. So uh, altogether, if everything goes well, when will you be uh, taking final vows? Let's see. The year is 2019. In 2025, um, that's, let's see, six years. I'm going to be 27. Wow. <laughs> awesome. So you're in 2025, you may be taking final vows. I might. Amazing. Hopefully. That's wonderful. Please, God. <laughs> <laughs> so then um, for your trip to Italy, what are you doing there? <laughs> so <laughs> um, one of my professors, Father Dempsey, <laughs> He um, he always talks about, I mean, he lived in Italy for 10 years, I think. And so he always talks about it in class. And Marissa and I would get so excited every time he mentioned something. So basically, Father Dempsey is our tour guide, our travel guide. He's given us all the places to go to. We're going to go to, we're flying into Milan. We'll be going to Noto in Sicily because that's where Marissa's ancestry is from. And then we're going back to up to Rome, uh, Florence, and then back to Milan. Awesome. It's going to be a wonderful little pilgrimage, huh? Yeah. Y'all staying at any convents? Unfortunately not. We, oh, we booked it man. too late. They were all taken. Darn and it. Airbnbs are cheaper. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so the what sites are you going to see? I don't know. I mean, obviously all the big ones are going to see the Colosseum, Trevi Fountain, the um, all the cathedrals. Um, yeah, all the touristy stuff. And then also we're going to see some of, um, some of the spots, Father Dempsey personally, and asked us to stop by and pray for him at the Capronica and all that. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So, and then whenever you get back, um, you go and visit with the, you go, will you go, will you go home first? Yeah, I'll be, you know, I'll be all over the place. Um, I'm going to go home. I'll go to Ann Arbor for a week in June, go home again, then go back to Ann Arbor. Oh, so how that's how that works for pre prostitutes? You um, go back and forth? N- no. So that's just for the summer. Then oh, once okay. I enter, I'm in oh, for a year. Okay. I, can, I mean, I can leave whenever I want, but I'm not going to want to leave. Oh, okay. So you have officially, they, they lock you into a cell in August. Yes. Oh, okay. I see. I can't wait. Cell, Chaley. Say ch- What? Cell comes from the word Chaley. Oh, does it really? I didn't know that. It's little piece of heaven. Really? Yeah. Is that where that comes from? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> wow. That's why they call it a cell. <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought it was because you were being thrown in prison. <laughs> and it was like, they're locking you up. The you can't best leave. kind of prison. The best <laughs> kind of prison. The prison with our Lord. Um, and so, yeah, because our Lord was thrown in prison. We, oh, we visited there in Israel where Jesus was thrown into prison um, it was crazy. Oh, I gotta tell you about it. That's great. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it right now. The, there's a hole in the top. And so what they would do was they would drop you through the hole and you would fall into the prison. Like it wasn't like the typical prisons today where you open up a door and push them in. They literally was a hole in the ground and they would drop you down the hole. Man, people were brutal back yeah. then. Yeah. <laughs> and so the way they got him out was they lowered a rope and they would attach it to him. And they pull him up out of it. I was like, that's crazy. And so they have carved out a staircase now. And so you can actually walk down there. And, uh, but I was looking and I was put my head through the hole. I wasn't supposed to, but I did. And, um, I was like, dang, if I fell from here, like I might break a bone. That's a long drop. <laughs> I think that's the idea. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. It was terrifying. And I, and I was like, that's probably why they don't want you picking your head through there. Um, so yeah. Oddly, it did not have like a glass uh, case on it or anything, but you could literally, you could fall down it if you tried. It was pretty crazy. Well, it's just like when you go to the Grand Canyon and they tell you don't get too close to the edge. I've never been to the Grand Canyon. Me neither. That's oh, what okay. I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Any last things you'd like to uh, talk about or any last things you want to bring up? Oh, I have a one question. So last question, maybe. From the beginning, you said that you were a feminist. So uh, you went from feminist to 
future sister. What's that like? (laughs) It's been quite a journey and honestly, it's ongoing. Um, When I was in high school, I I say that like it was a long time ago. It's not, it was three years ago. Um, That was kind of the thing, like feminism was coming back in style. And so here I was like, and like I said, everyone in my high school is very apologetic about being Catholic. So I was kind of like a, well, you know, I'd maybe probably pro be pro-life if I got pregnant, but I'm not going to tell you what to do with your body. And there was actually, I had a religion teacher at my Catholic high school who told me that even if you're pro-life, if your friend is pro-choice and gets pregnant, then you should be driving her to the abortion clinic because that's the loving Christian thing to do. That's crazy. Is not to impose your will on, on her. Yeah. So that was what I was getting. And these were my religion teachers. So I was like, Oh, this, this has got to be true. That's a pretty, and this is a real scenario that I found myself in my best friend in high school. One day came up and was like, I think I might be pregnant. And I was like, well, my theology professor said that this is what I should do. So I was like, well, you know what? Um, to my friend, I told her, if you're pregnant, I'll take you to the Planned Parenthood. No. And I thought that was the good and right thing to do. Thank God she turned out to not be pregnant. That would have been a terrible mistake. And it oh still haunts me. Gosh. It still haunts me. Whoa. That's terrifying. Yeah. Bad and catechesis can kill people. Tell me about it. And this was, I mean, I had friends who the conversations we were having in high school were like, Oh, this is, this is not appropriate. I can't say this, but you know how there's this movement to, for women to stop wearing bras and for women to be able to, to go topless in public. Ew. I know. <laughs> I don't want to be vulgar, but, um, and then there's like women who I, I had friends who thought that, you know, pornography was so empowering Whoa. and these were the conversations I was having. And this was what I was being exposed to. And I was like, well, I mean, I didn't have anyone telling me otherwise. And so I was like, I guess it makes sense. I guess women should be able to walk around topless. I mean, they do it in tribes in Africa. Why not here? Oh my gosh. (laughs) And so I started to become radicalized and I'm like, I'm not a person who does things by halves. Like I like being radical. (laughs) And so if I was going to be a feminist, I was going to be the best feminist out there. (laughs) And that was where I was at. That's why I marched up to sister Thomas Aquinas that one time and started telling her off about why, why can't women be priests? And that was what I thought. And then it's been such a journey. I went from there to coming to terms um, through the theology of the body to to coming to terms with the role of the feminine in the universe. Um, And then from there, I started calling myself a Catholic feminist. And then it wasn't until later that I was like, the term feminism is a social construct. It's something that the society has come up with to try to accomplish with the Catholic Church already teaches. Why should I call myself a feminist if the Catholic Church knows more about women than feminists do? So make for me a distinction between a Catholic feminist and a Catholic. Basically, what it boils down to is a Catholic feminist is probably pro-life, sometimes against contraception. (laughs) Um, It's just still wanting to be a part of the culture. Um, while also being Catholic, it's like, I, I just, it just doesn't, it rubs me the wrong way. It's like trying to be, um, both at the same time. Trying to be in the world and, uh, not of the world, but at the same time of the world. Yeah. It's like both. And that finally, that just bugged me too much. And so I was like, the only reason I'm calling myself a feminist is because women are telling me that I should. And that if I don't call myself a feminist, I'm somehow a terrible person and I hate myself and I want to be a slave and abused by a man. This is just, this is what, you know, the stereotype is. And I was like, no, the Catholic church crowned Mary as the crown of creation, as the queen of heaven and earth. How is this a bad thing? (laughs) Yeah. We're so oppressive. (laughs) And even then by reading the saints, I started to realize that we shouldn't seek glory or power or any of those things. I mean, this is, it's easier said than done, right? But the saints, like St. Therese, she wanted to be small and little. She had her little way. Um, the way that she became a saint and a doctor of the church was not through power and autonomy and um, exerting her will over people. It was by becoming completely subservient. 
And that's so difficult for women today. I get it. It's difficult. And maybe that's our cross. Maybe our cross is to learn how to be submissive because I know when women hear that word, they cringe. I I still cringe, but I realize that to be submissive to God is my purpose in life. So, so what message would you give to Catholic women of today? Be Catholic, be saints. Um, the church is offering you more than the world ever can. You can call yourself a feminist, but that doesn't capture the full extent of what God has planned for you. Feminism is so small in comparison to the glory that God offers to women. And so, wow, that was beautiful. Very succinct and beautiful. Very Thomistic. Uh, the, um, last thing, will you wear a habit? I hope so. I'm looking forward to it. Those habits look really comfy. And I think, so I read somewhere that the sisters say they even wear their veils to sleep. No way. I read that somewhere and I can't tell if they're joking or not. No, that's so cool. I've heard they have a sleeping veil that's separate from their like daytime veil. (laughs) That's so dope. If they were joking about that, I'm going to feel really stupid. (laughs) You have to tell whenever you uh, finally get back. And like two years, you had to come and tell me whether he did or send me a letter, send yeah. me a letter and let me know. <gasps> they do. They do have veils. <laughs> they do have sleeping veils. That's pretty hardcore. That's what I love about being Catholic. We're just like so hardcore about everything. Yeah. So the, uh, that's awesome. That's great. So you're not going to wear a pantsuit? Lord almighty. No. <laughs> <laughs> God forbid. Before we close out, I forgot to uh, put in this plug real quick. So I'm recording this afterwards and I'm playing through it and I was listening and thought, oh my gosh, I forgot to tell y'all to subscribe and to email me any questions at Fonseca production at gmail.com. That's Fonseca, F-O-N-S-E-C-A production at gmail.com for any questions, comments, or concerns. And to subscribe, just uh, look us up on any platform that's iTunes, uh, TuneIn, Stitcher, Spotify, anywhere you listen to podcasts, uh, ours is listed under Catholic Conversations. Just look us up and subscribe and you'll get our um, podcast every week. We are trying to test out whether what day works best. I was doing it on Fridays. I'm going to test it on Mondays for the next few weeks and I may move back to Fridays. We'll see what happens and follow us on social media. Uh, I am available at Instagram at F-F-O-N-Z-E. That's f Fonzi. Uh, on Twitter at the same handle. And then on Facebook, Adrian Fonseca. Uh, that's where you can find me. Uh, and you can uh, follow me, message me there, however you want to get in contact with me. Other than that, tune in next week for our conversation next week. I'm not sure uh, what we will, when we'll get back to talking about music, but we are going to put that on the back burner for now. And I put us back in to close out in prayer with Emily. All righty. Uh, so... Uh, let's close out in a Hail Mary in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, e benedictus fructus ventris tu Iesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostri. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.